let's open in prayer tonight. And uh, as I said, it's really good, really good to see everybody out tonight. Praise God. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters who are ever faithful to you, Lord. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you will uh, help us as we study this portion of Scripture. And Lord, uh, I pray you'll speak to each and every one of us in the way that you know we can understand. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for, for being our teacher. And I pray that there, were, there would be encouragement, blessing, and exhortation here tonight, Father, through your word. We ask that in Jesus' holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 9, uh, we're going to go from verse 17 to 25. And I'm, I'm starting to hear more from the Lord, not to rush, not to rush through things, because the Lord wants to, he wants to speak to us. He wants to teach us. So in verse 17, Acts 9 and 17, you'll remember Paul got knocked off his, we believe it was a horse, it could have been a mule, who knows. But uh, then he was taken to a house, remember, on Straight Street, and so we pick up the story there. So God spoke to Ananias and said, I want you to go and pray for Paul. He's a chosen vessel. So Ananias went, to, went his way, verse 17, and he entered into the house and put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto you in the way as you were coming, has sent me to you that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes something that looked like scales, and he received sight and arose and was baptized. Wow. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul was there with the disciples which were at Damascus for certain days, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I know we're going to get into that, but is that not an amazing story? He, his eyes get opened, he received the Lord, and right away he's preaching. That is, that's the Lord. Verse 21 says, Acts chapter 9 and verse 21, But all that heard him were amazed, and they said, Isn't this the one who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? And he, now he's come here for that intent that he might bring those bound or in chains to the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled and the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known by Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. You know, Ecclesiastes says there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. And I think there's a time to fight and a time to be wise and take off. And uh, Jesus did that in his ministry as well. He knew they were after him and he left. And... Uh, this is a great story. So we're going to go back to verses 17 through 19, where God speaks to Ananias. And if you'll remember last week, we studied Ananias said, Lord, don't you know this is the person who was persecuting the church? So Ananias uh, was told, just go. And you know, the point I wanted to make here is God moves through just one person's obedience. And I, and I want to tell you a story. So, uh, you know, everybody, I think, knows Big Louie that comes here. Uh, he comes here a lot. So, I, how I met him was really quite amazing. I, it, typically, when I'm asked to do a funeral for a family that I'm not really friends with uh, and barely know them, I usually just do the funeral and then let them have their family time. But the family asked me to go and join them at their banquet after the funeral. And I, I really felt compelled to go. And to make a very long story short, I sat next to Louie, got to know him. And then my friend of 45 years, 
Ben, who's also coming to our church now, had been diligently looking for a place to live. They were going to sell the house he was renting, and he had nowhere to go, and he's got a lot of stuff. And uh, God gave Louis a heart for Ben and moved him on his property and got him a big 45-foot storage container to put all of his things in and, and have like his own little garage. And so my point is this. When you're obedient to the Lord, God can use you to be somebody else's answer to prayer. And so I, I want to go through some scriptures here because obedience brings blessings. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, God talks about sacrifices that the people were making. And God said, I'm sick of your sacrifices. When, when you make many prayers, I'm going to hide my eyes from you. That's all in Isaiah chapter 1. God doesn't want sacrifices. He wants obedience. He wants us to obey him. So let's go ahead and look at John chapter 14. And we're just going to go through some scriptures on obedience. John 14, 21. Jesus said, He that keeps my command has my commandments and keeps them. That is the one who loves me. And he that loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. And I will show myself to him. So it's not just about knowing what God does and knowing who he is. It's knowing him. And then saying yes to what he asks us to do. And sometimes the Lord asks us to do things that don't make any sense at all. But his ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11. So that'd be the fifth book in your Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 11. So the Lord really spoke to me as I was studying this just about obedience, just to be obedient. And you know, sometimes obedience costs. Think about the 12 disciples. They all had families. They all had children. Uh, actually, we'll talk about one that's... Uh, uh, was it no it's not Andrew who was the tax collector Matthew Matthew had a job he had a family and he had kids he had a job and his job was for the Roman government so you mess up with the Roman government you're you're not going to be living too long and here's Matthew sitting at the seat of the customs where they paid taxes and Jesus just walked up to him and said follow me so he followed. Now that's going to cost. I'm sure his wife said, where are you going? Who is this guy? When are you going to be back? He didn't come back for three years. So sometimes our obedience will cost other people something as well. Amen? Uh, so it's not, it just doesn't cost us. It costs others as well. But there's always a blessing involved. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 through 28. Behold, God says, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord, which I command you, which I, your God, command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord, your God. But you turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day, to go after other gods, which you have not known. I wonder if we really thought about the other gods that we have just in our country. And I'm not talking about Buddha statues or anything like that. I'm talking about physical things. You know, people go after money. They go after position and power and politics and all these other things instead of the Lord. And I know, you know, there's people, I'm sure, in Washington, D.C. that know Jesus but uh, I know of a congressman who was in Washington and didn't go back after his term was over because it's so, it's so much corruption. People are offering you condos in the Caymans and money in Switzerland and this and that and the other. And after a while, it just corrupts you. And Jesus said that first. He said, evil communication or bad company corrupts good manners. It's absolutely true. If you hang around with a thief... Eventually, you're going to end up stealing something. It's just the way it is. 
So um, God says, I set before you a blessing if you obey and a curse if you don't. And then in John chapter 15, so we back into the New Testament in the book of John, the 15th chapter and the 10th verse. Does that make any sense, church? Amen. John 15 and verse 10. Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. In other words, you'll stay in perfect love if you obey God's commandments. You'll stay in perfect love. And what does 1 John say about perfect love? Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment, and he that fears is not made perfect in love. But perfect love casts out fear. So if we obey God, so now, now here's, here's what I'm trying to say. How many people turned tail and ran when they told them, shut it down? And, and you know, you think about all the things that have happened and all the businesses that have gone out of business. If people would have stood and said, no, this isn't right, were they going to arrest the whole country? There's not enough people to arrest the whole country. So it takes somebody to obey and somebody to say yes to God and then blessings follow. So um, John 15.10, Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So let's talk about just that right there. So God's commandments are to love him, not with half our heart, but with all of our heart and all of our soul, and all of our strength. So I've talked to people that just say, I fell in love with this girl. I have to marry her. I can't be without her. I love her so much. I have to be with her. That's the kind of love God's talking about. That if it came to a choice between the Lord and Caesar, we would pick the Lord every time. Okay? So in, in uh, John 15.10, he says... If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. So if you don't, you won't abide in God's love. He loves you, but the love of God chases away fear. And if you're not walking in love, you're, you're going you're, you're to have fear. You're, you're going to not obey the Lord. So there's so many things that have happened where people have had to learn, wait a minute, we ought to obey God rather than men. Especially when men command you to disobey God. That's crazy. You know, a guy sent me a text today and he said, black lives matter. Except for the ones that are killing each other in Chicago and all the ones that are aborted. And I thought, you know, that's really thought provoking. If black lives matter, every life matters. So babies matter in the womb. Every life matters. And... Um, in order to obey God, we have to love him with all of, all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul. And we have to love our neighbor as ourself. So 1 John, this is where I want to go now, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. Now whatsoever we ask, we will receive of him because we keep his commandments. So here's something that I've developed in my life. When, when I have someone come up and say, hey, can you preach here or can you do this service or you can do that? If I'm available, I always say yes. And I've had people say, well, aren't you going to pray about it? Why should I pray about a commandment of God? God says, preach the word. He didn't say where or when. He just said, do it. So when you're invited to keep the commandments of God, we need to keep them. We need to keep them. So 1 John 3.22, he says, Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So let's talk about some of those commandments. God says not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But we are to exhort one another and so much the more as we see that day, the day of Christ, approaching. Amen? That's one of them. There's another one that says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And that's, that's a holy hug or a holy embrace. Okay, so we are to do that. And the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's another commandment. 
that we are commanded to praise the Lord. And then we're commanded to pray without ceasing. That's a commandment in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're to pray without ceasing. So when someone tells you, hey, you can't hug one another. You can't, you can't go to church. You can't sing. You can't praise the Lord. You have to stay away from all that. Would God be pleased with that? So we have to make a decision. Are we going to obey the Lord rather than obeying someone that we might be afraid of? Because when we're filled with perfect love, what are you going to be afraid of? What are you going to be afraid of? Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't preach it if I didn't live it. I mean, I remember the day, and, and Rick can't be here tonight. He texted me earlier, our, our gardener. Uh, Rick and Maggie are doing some other things with family. But Rick and I were out here talking, and, and the COVID police pulled up. And when they got out, they were serious. They had badges and guns on. So uh, I knew that we're going to have to discuss something with them. And you know, all, all they wanted to do is see if we were having church. And I was honest with him and said, yes, we are. And then he just stopped in the middle of his questioning and said, and you guys have heard this story, can you pray for us? And, we, and I said, sure, what do you want me to pray for? And he said, everywhere we go, we get harassed. And I said, yeah, I can understand that. And I understand also you're trying to do your job. So yeah, let's pray. We held hands and prayed. They got in their car and left. And here Satan was telling everybody, if you do that, you're going to prison. Now I know in Canada they are. They are going to prison. But you know what? Those pastors haven't stopped preaching. They have stood. They have preached. And many of them are in jail now. And God's coming to their rescue. So keeping his commandments. Leviticus chapter 25. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Third, third book in your uh, Old Testament. Leviticus, I shouldn't even call it the Old Testament. I could just say in the word of God. Leviticus 25 verses 18 and 19. God says, wherefore you will do my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And that's when you'll dwell in the land safely. And the land will yield her fruit, and you will eat to your fill, and live in it in safety. And, you know, I just want to mention Ukraine. Uh, we've heard stories of rockets being shot into Ukraine, and they don't know where they went. They just disappear. We saw a video of, a, of a, an elderly man who was run over by a tank. He was in his car, and a tank ran over him. He survived. So God is doing real miracles there because people are praying and they're trusting the Lord. And you know, that whole situation has drawn a whole bunch of people together in Europe. So God has his way of making all things work together for good. Then in James chapter 1 and verse 25, uh, the book of uh, James... James 1 and 25 says, But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, by the way, liberty is the freedom to do what's right. That's what liberty is. Liberty isn't I can do what I want. Liberty is the freedom to do what's right, especially what's right before God. So whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, that man will be blessed in his deed. Praise God. When we obey the Lord, he blesses us. And then uh, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 19. We talked about Isaiah 1 where the Lord tells him, why are you bringing these sacrifices to me? Your smoke is an incense to my nose. When you make many prayers, I'm going to hide my face from you. Who told you to come into my courts and tread down my courts? And then he gets into verse 18, or verse 17, and he says, Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. This is Isaiah chapter 1 in verse 17. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you were willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with the sword because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So I look at the landscape of the world right now. And what I see with my observations is a falling away. And I realize there are people still getting saved. I get that. But I, I talk to other pastors and they say, man, I don't know what's going on. It just seems like the church is losing people. And, and, there, and yeah, and Jack, you attend one of the biggest ones here in Santa Maria. And, and it's, it's a falling away. And, you know, God prophesied that through the prophet Amos. In Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, the scripture says, Thus saith the Lord, in the last days I will send a famine in the land. And it will not be a famine for bread or hunger. It won't be a famine of water for thirst. But it will be a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And then the scripture says, They will wander from coast to coast, from the north even to the east, but they won't be able to find it. And he says, in that day, the young men and the young virgins will faint for thirst. So God prophesies that there will be a falling away. And it is amazing when, when the Lord brings out his commands and says, you need to obey this. That's when people get ruffled. That's, and it's not a rule book. His commands are not grievous. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hey, if you love your neighbor, you won't kill him. If you love your neighbor, you won't steal from him. If you love your neighbor, you won't covet what he has. Amen? So that's what God's talking about here. And then lastly, in John chapter 13. I have a sign in, uh, in my office that says, pray when it's the hardest. <laughs> so obey when it's the hardest. Amen? Because there's always a great blessing. John chapter 13, and starting with verse 13. Jesus said, you call me master, and you call me Lord. You say, well, because I am. If I am, and your Lord, and your master, and I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus was a servant. Verse 16. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Amen. So obedience brings blessings. And then when we get back to Acts chapter 9, in verse 20, the Bible says, straightway Paul preached Christ in the synagogues. Wait a minute. He came to Damascus with papers to tie people up in chains and haul them off to prison. Now he's in the synagogues preaching Jesus, the very person and people that he was persecuting. He was changed. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So when you read that in the Greek, and we've talked about this before, that's written in the present Greek uh, continuous tense. It's called, and I, it's hard for me to pronounce this word, A-E-R-O-I-S-T, errorist. That's a hard word for me to pronounce. But what it means, it's like a river. So God says, this is what he's really saying when you read the Greek language. If anyone is in Christ, he's continually becoming a new creation. Old things are continually being passed out of his life, and new things are continually coming in. So I want to tell you a story. You haven't heard this one before. So uh, when I pastored in Avila Beach, I had a good friend named Blackie. And Blackie used to be an outlaw biker out of San Francisco. But he got saved. And, of course, you remember Blackie and you girls back there are smiling. <laughs> I should say you ladies. You're not. 
<laughs> I still see it at nine years old. Anyway, <laughs> so he said, hey, I want you to go to this um, Christian biker thing that we're having out in Wasna. And I said, well, who's going to be there? And he, he named this guy. And I'd heard that name before, that that person had a pretty big church in Los Angeles. And they were attracting all kinds of motorcycle people and homeless people. And, and they were doing a good work from what I had heard. And so I went. And we're, we're in this place where it's probably about half as big as this. It'd fit maybe 100 people. And we're waiting for these guys to show up from Los Angeles. And all of a sudden, I hear like thunder coming up the road. And it was a dirt road. And these guys are riding 50 miles an hour on a dirt road. That's crazy. You know, 20 maybe, but not 50. And they're coming up the road in this big cloud of dust. And as they're getting closer, I'm thinking they look like hell's angels. And they get off the bike, and I mean, they look like outlaws. And they were slapping each other on the back, you know. And, and they came in, and, and I told Blackie, I said, you know, brother... I'm just not getting a lot of peace out of this. I'm just not. And then when they started the music, it was, it was really like punk rock music. And, and he said, you, you seem disturbed. And I said, look, you can't take God's word and put him in Satan's music. You know, God has his music and Satan has his music. And you can't take God's word. You can't put new wine in old wineskins. And the music was, I mean, it was loud and it was brash and it was like the stuff I used to listen to before I got saved. And, and I just said, uh, honestly, I, I just don't bear witness with this, brother. I said, I, I love you and I, I'm, I'm not doubting these guys' salvation, but I'm just not bearing witness. There's something not right here. Well, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because three months later, the LAPD rolled tanks up on their houses that they had and busted them for selling meth and heroin and all kinds of other stuff that was going on. And that was the leadership. And some of them went to prison. So I knew in my heart, no, the scripture says if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passing away and new things are coming in. And I don't see any difference between these guys and HAs, Hell's Angels. And I didn't. I didn't see any difference at all. So we have to understand that when Christ comes in, he makes changes in us, whether we like it or not. He just makes changes. Joe, Pastor Joe, if somebody would have told me and you back in the day, oh, you guys are going to be preachers, we'd have laughed them to scorn. Yeah, and Joe goes, boom. <laughs> That's crazy. But yet... My first year, actually my first two months, I preached my first sermon at Mount Zion Church of God in Christ. My very first message. I went to confess to the pastor that we had broken some of his windows. And we were the guys that were cussing and throwing rocks at him. And now I'm saved and I want to pay for stuff. And he said, the only way you can pay is to come here and share how you got saved. And I, that was my very first sermon. I, all I did was talk about what God did for me. And two people accepted Jesus as their Savior that night. So I really believe that when Christ comes in, there's a difference. Now, you're not going to be perfect. Nobody's perfect except Jesus. But there's a change. And Pastor Joe talks about that all the time on Sunday. There's going to be a change. There has to be a change. If there's not a change, you take a look in your heart and find out what's going on. Amen? There has to be a change. Okay, so in Proverbs 28.1, the Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. But wicked men flee when no one even pursues them. So the righteous will stand and make a stand, and wicked will just run away. Romans 10, 13 through 17. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he goes on to say, how shall they call in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard without a preacher? How can they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, 
Somebody may uh, protest that and say, well, I'm not a preacher. Yeah, you are. Yeah, all of us have been ordained by God. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you. And I have ordained you to go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit would remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Yeah, not, not everybody stands at one of these. In fact, for 10 years, uh, Barbara, I never did in Avila. I always stood down there. But so people can see, they ask me, can you please get up and stand behind the wooden pulpit? Okay, you may not have a wooden pulpit to preach from, but your life preaches. Your life preaches. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And man, I, you know, I've told you that hunting story where Nick wanted to stop and have a cigarette. And uh, then he asked, how do I get what you guys have? We said, what are you talking about? And he said, you guys are like brothers. You're so close. We hardly talked on the way over there. But he saw the light. He saw that there was the love of God there. And you know, I've had people tell me when they come into this church, wow, there's so much love in this church. And I look around, sometimes I just stand over here and watch, and I see different people get up and greeting new people that have been here for the first time. And I've never taught that. But you're doing that because the love of God lives in you. And you, you're compelled to go and do that. Amen? Man, I'll tell you what, I am so blessed to be a servant to this church. I am so blessed that this body of Christ, you believers, I am so blessed. I, I hear horror stories from preachers that just say, man, they're stabbing me in the back everywhere I go. And I tell them, well, it's the only place they can stab you if you're in the lead. <laughs> but you know, I, I thank God. I thank God for the love in this church. And it's infectious, isn't it? It's absolutely infectious. So in Romans uh, 10, 13, or 10, 15, how can they preach except they be sent? And then verse 16 says, they haven't all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? Not everybody's going to receive it, but there are plenty who will. I'll stop right there and tell you another story. <laughs> So Brother Blaine, who's now pastoring in Santa Inez, he and I used to go knocking on doors. We, we went to a church over by the airport. Uh, it was called Vision of Hope. And we went there and uh, we taught a class on discipleship. And then we said, okay, it's time to put our feet to our prayers. So now there were 48 or 50 people in our class. And we said, now Tuesday night, we're going to meet and we're going to go out and take all these cards that were turned into visitors and we're going to go visit them. We're going to knock on their door and meet him and greet him and find out do you know Jesus and pray for him and do all that. So we're out there and we knocked on the door of this sweetest little old lady. She opened up the door, you know, and said, hi boys, how are you? And we said, we're fine. We're just in the neighborhood, you know. Uh, we, we, a man next door visited our church and we thought, well, we'll come next door and invite you to come as well. And she said, what church is it? And we told her and she said, oh, and uh, I think it was Blaine that said, uh, can I ask you a question? And she said, sure. And he said, God forbid, you know, we're all going to die. But if you were to die tonight, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Bam, she slammed that door. <laughs> and then we went to another house where the guy come to the door and he had one of those uh, t-shirts without the arms, you know, and uh, holding a beer and he had a cigar in his hand. And he said, what do you need? And uh, I think it was Blaine again that said, well, we're just here to pray for people. And the guy said, well, go ahead and pray then. And we ended up leading that guy to the Lord. And he's the one that should have slammed the door. So you never know who's going to receive the gospel. But God tells us to go and share it. You know? And um, so we... Here's another story. that You haven't heard this one either. Uh, Monday, I rode with eight other guys, Louie was among them, to King City. And we went on all the back roads. So on the way back, we rode on Highway uh, 25, which is Indian Valley Road. It's a real bumpy, back-in-the-country road. Nobody even drives on it. And we pulled over just to kind of rest because we were getting jiggled quite a bit. <laughs> and this 86-year-old guy who was born in Santa Maria, we found out all this when we were talking to him, drives up in one of those little four-wheeled uh, 
motorcycle deer hunting rigs, you know, whatever they're called. And uh, he pulled up and he wouldn't quit talking to Reuben. He just kept talking to him and talking to him. So I went over and I said, who's your friend? And he said, I just met the guy. And his name was Roy. And we were talking to Roy and then Reuben just said, we need to pray for him. And so we prayed for him, shared the gospel with him and God had us go on that whole trip for one guy. Just one guy. That's the only guy he brought across our path. Uh, that was, that's what God will do. If, you, if you're just out living life, God will bring you somebody special that, that needs to hear about him. He really will. And you all know that anyway. So Ezekiel chapter 36, if you'll turn the book of Ezekiel. So if, if you get into Psalms, that's in the middle of your Bible. Then just turn to your right. And you go past Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. You'll get into Isaiah. And then go Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Or you can turn to page 1197. Uh, <laughs> Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. So God says, I will take you from among the heathen. Now, what's very interesting about that is Sandra's son, that literally happened to him. He was in a motorcycle gang called the Heathen. The Heathen Motorcycle Club. And God took him out of that, put him in another club, and then moved him back east, and he's received the Lord as his Savior. So this is perfect scripture for him. I should send it to him. For I will take you from among the heathen, and I will gather you from all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. Obviously, it's a prophecy about Israel. But then he goes on to say, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. Anybody know what the clean water is? The blood. The blood of Christ. And you will be clean from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will cleanse you. You know, that is an amazing thing to me. I mean, I know what I've done in my life. Past present and don't know what I'm going to do in the future but God's covered it all he covers it with his blood and to me that's amazing that the Lord can take guilty and say innocent I will put in you a new heart I will put in you a new spirit and I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. So guys, I just want to ask you a question tonight. Before you were saved, it was far and few between that you wept or cried tears, even at funerals. Amen? Yeah. Afterwards, how you doing? <laughs> you, amen. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. God literally took our stony heart out of us and gave us a heart of flesh. And my daughter makes fun of me because she calls me a little daffodil. <laughs> Every time I see a sad movie or a sad story, tears come down. And the grandkids, she's trained them now to look. Papa's crying. <laughs> God only can do that. And that's the heart that Jesus has. You know, when his best friend was in the grave, Jesus wept. When he came into Jerusalem and saw the hardness of their hearts, he wept over the city. He said, man, I would have loved to have gathered you like a hen gathers her chickens, but you refused. And he wept. He says, I'll put my spirit in you and enable you to walk in my statutes and you'll keep my judgments and you'll do them. We can only do that by the Holy Spirit. That's why religion never works. Because religion is about us. It's about our goodness and trying to do the right thing before God. You'll never be able to do it. It has to be the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to do those things. Especially to forgive. I was just recently asked to do the funeral of our former pastor, uh, Dale Ackley. And I love Dale. Dale and I used to ride motorcycles every Tuesday for three years. We rode motorcycles together. You know, there were some things that happened in his life that weren't so good. But love covers the multitude of sins. Amen? That, I mean, 
God covered our sins by love. Love covers a multitude of sins. So some, some things we just have to get over. And the family called me and said, hey, I know it's been a long time. And I know you and dad had a really good meeting up in Paso Robles after he left the church a year later. Would you consider doing his funeral? And I said, I would be honored. Dale was my friend. You know, and I would be happy to go up and preach Jesus and talk about the Lord and talk about some of the great times we had and, and remember the good things. You know, we all have bad things in our life. We all have things that we're not proud of. We all have things that, I don't think there's anybody in this church, especially me, that would want our life written up on the board up here. You know, just, uh, you know, uh, here's another story. So I, I was in Goleta on a workers' comp claim, and they said, follow this guy. We know he's doing something. We know he's not being truthful. So I, I finally found out how to, how to get him leaving. He left out of his back alley, but I followed him all the way to Goleta. And uh, he had a lo- one of those big, long surfboards. So uh, he, he's a terrible surfer. He kept crashing into the rocks. So I got so bored, I had like three hours of film on the guy. So I went up on the highway and did the wide world of sports. You know how I got the whole coastline and then zeroed in and back out. And, uh, and at one point I was thinking, oh, dude, you, you are slammed. And you know what the Lord said to me? I got you under surveillance too. And not just what you're doing, but your thought life too. And man, I just kind of shriveled into a little mushroom and said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. And I learned a really good lesson from that. I learned a really good lesson from that. That, you know, God wants truth. He doesn't want to mock. He doesn't want to accuse. He wants truth. Amen? So, um, where are we at here? Ezekiel. He says, I'll put in a new heart, take out your stony heart, and put my spirit in you. And when I do that, you'll be able to follow my commands. Still a choice, though. God didn't say, you will do it. God said, I want you to do it if you love me. If you love me, keep my commandments. God isn't a taskmaster and he's not a dictator. He gives us the choice, yay or nay. Okay, Psalm 51. This psalm is a psalm of David. Uh, I can remember this one because my phone number's in here, my old phone number. I, my old phone number was uh, 5110. And uh, it always reminded me of this scripture here. Psalm 51, starting with verse 6. The scripture says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. God wants the truth. We could, do, we could say a lot of stuff, and we can do a lot of stuff. But you know God's looking in here? He is. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, He's looking at our motives, not at our actions. He's looking at our motives. So... He says, I desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, so that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. I'd call that repentance. Amen? That's David repenting. That's David saying, hey, I'm, I'm fessing up. I've got iniquities. I've, I've got sins. I need to be washed. I need to be clean. And then verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. You know what David was saying is, I had a right spirit. But then somehow I got lifted up and went into sin. And now I need that spirit back. I need you to create that right spirit back in me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. And that's when I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. It's really hard to convert sinners when you're not converted. (laughs) It's kind of like trying to tell someone who's on drugs, if you've, if you've never been there and done that, it's really difficult to minister to them and let them know what to do. It's just, God uses everybody. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. 
God has this amazing conversation with this Jewish man named Nicodemus. And it's a real interesting story because Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews and he was a man of the Pharisees. So he was one of, you know, in the top rulers of Israel. And verse 2 says, John 3 verse 2, that same person, Nicodemus, came to Jesus at nighttime. I thought that was an interesting point there. He didn't come in the day where all of his buddies could see him. He came at night. And usually, especially in those days, at night people stayed home. Yeah, they didn't have street lights or any of that. So most people, when it got dark, they were at home. But Nicodemus came at night to Jesus and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God. No man can do the miracles that you're doing except God be with him. And Jesus said to him, Jesus knew exactly why Nicodemus was coming to him. He, 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 didn't, he, he didn't take that, uh, you know, that uh, compliment, if you will. He just went right to the heart of why Nicodemus was there. He answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, Except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was there saying, basically he wanted to know, how do we get to heaven? What way is there that we get to heaven? How do we do that? And Jesus said, you've got to be born again. You have to be born again. Nicodemus said, I, I, I don't understand. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he go the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, that's just ridiculous. Jesus said, no. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I want to park right there because people twist that scripture and make it into a cult. You have to be baptized or you can't be saved. Not true. He's talking about a fleshly birth and a spiritual birth. You have to be born first of a woman. Through, and how are we born through a woman? Through water. When her water breaks, that's how we're born. And then we have to be born of the Spirit the same way. The Spirit of God has to break through our pride and our stubbornness and all of the things that we hold up against God. He has to break through all of that and make us born again. He explains that in verse 6. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. When you're born through water, you're flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. So in verse 20, I think that illustrates, Saul got changed. God put in a new heart in him. He put in a new spirit. Do we always obey God? I don't. Just to be honest with you. There's times I know the Lord has said to me, don't do that, and I do it anyway. And I have the same problem Paul had in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, or Romans chapter 7. Where he said, the things that I want to do, I end up not doing them. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing them. And he said, what a wretched man I am. Who is going to deliver me from this body of sin? He said, so now I've come to the understanding that with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And with my spirit I serve the law of God. And it's just the nature that we have. And we're never going to get rid of that until we get to heaven. But God can give us the ability to... to we're, we're never going to be in a place where we don't sin at all. There's people that preach that too. And here's the bottom line on that. First John chapter 1, verse 8, If any man says he has not sinned, he makes God a liar, and the truth isn't in him. And then First John 1, 10, If he says he has not sinned, the word isn't in him. So verse 9 is right in the middle. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's in 1 John chapter 1. So Saul becomes this changed man. And then in verses 21 and 22 of Acts chapter 9, those who heard Saul were amazed at the change in him. See, that's what, I, that's what God was teaching me in these scriptures. You don't... The, the, the head of the Salvation Army, I forget what his name was, but do you know what he told his people? He said, preach the gospel wherever you can, whenever you can, to anyone that you can. And if you need to use words, go ahead. <laughs> 
So we're preaching all the time. And I've learned something from children, especially little grandchildren. They hear what you say, but they do what you do. It's so true. They see what you do more than they hear what you say. And it's so true. So people see what we do more than hear what we say. Amen. Those who heard Saul were amazed at the change in him. So let's take a look. Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24. Galatians right after 2 Corinthians. Galatians 1.11. Paul speaks about his authority in the Lord. Because, you know, I'm sure in the 12 disciples, remember they argued about who was going to be the top guys? Uh, <laughs> and the other time they came back and said, you want us to send fire down and snuff those guys? So they were still men. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the power yet. Jesus told him in Acts 1.8, wait until you're endued with power from on high. Wait till the Holy Spirit comes on you. Then you'll get power to be witnesses to me. So I'm sure they probably thought, who's this guy? Who's he think he is? He's the guy that was beating up on Christians and having them dragged into prison. Now all of a sudden he's preaching to everybody? You know, that's human nature. So in verse 11, Paul said, I certify you, brethren, That the gospel which was preached by me is not a man's gospel. It's not after man. I didn't receive it from a man, neither was I taught it. But I was taught it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conduct in the time past when I was in the Jews' religion. How beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, I wasted it. Wow. Verse 14. I profited in the Jews' religion above many of my own equals in my own nation. I was more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Boy, there's a good one for Psalm 139. It's God that gives birth. I know he uses the woman to bring it through, but it's God that makes people alive. And they're alive the minute they're conceived. That's a baby. That's not a little piece of flesh that later becomes a baby. That is a baby right then. Verse 16. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. So immediately I didn't go to people. I didn't go to flesh and blood. I didn't go and say, how do I do this? He said, neither did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles. But I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. In other words, he went in the desert to spend time with God. I knew a preacher in New Cuyama. His name was Dick Huggert. And I did his funeral. He was 96 when he passed away. And he was telling me there were times that uh, he went into the, I guess in New Cuyama there's these gullies that the river carves. He'd go into these gullies for two or three days and just seek God. Nobody would know where he was. He's going there and pray and pray and seek God in these dry riverbed things in New Cuyama. And I, I heard testimony at his funeral from a couple of people who were still alive that heard him preach. And they said, man, when that guy preached, it was like the sword through the heart. You know? So he had, he had power with the Lord because he spent time with the Lord. He, so Paul says, I, I, I went to Arabia and I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, that's when I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And I stayed with him for 15 days. But the other apostles I didn't see, like, uh, except James, and the, uh, who is the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write to you, I'm not lying. Verse 21, afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Sicilia. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. He walked in their church. They said, who's this? Who's this guy? They didn't know who he was. He said, but they heard only that I was the one who persecuted Christians in the time past. But now I'm preaching the faith, which I once destroyed. Wow. You know, 
I'm not proud of some of the things I said to Christians before I got saved. I mean, I cussed at them. There was some I mocked, made fun of. Uh, God will get you for that. I remember distinctly on the corner of Main and, no, not Main, Cook and Broadway. There's a Chase Bank there now. But there used to be a little motorcycle shop there called Stock or Not Motorcycles. Sonny uh, Curto uh, owned that shop. He was a friend of mine. And we were standing out in front. Uh, I think we were smoking a joint. And this woman walked up. She was very well dressed. She had a dress on and had a big Bible in her hand. And she had uh, a speech impediment. And she began to talk to us about the Lord. And uh, I mocked her. And Sonny grabbed me by the arm and he pulled me aside and he said, God, dude, don't you fear God? And I remember saying, there is no God. And Sonny was Catholic. He's a Sicilian. So he, he just walked away. He said, dude, you know, you're crazy. So I finally told this woman, yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll listen. Because everybody else kind of walked away. I said, I'll listen, but I'm going to go in the back and shoot some heroin first. Well, I've never shot heroin in my life. But I just did that for shock value. And I remember seeing her tears coming down her face and she turned around and walked away. And you can ask Debbie Stilwell this. The night I got baptized, Thelma was sitting right in the front row. Her Delma, Delma was her name. Sitting right in the front row. And when I was getting baptized, I looked and it was that same lady I mocked who tried to witness to me. And I thought, you know what? I wonder what she was thinking. So afterwards, I went up and I said, do you remember me? And she just looked at me and she said, I prayed for you. And when you talk about, <laughs> boom, <laughs> out of the seat. God will get you, but God will restore you and God will heal you. Amen. So they were amazed. In verse 24, Paul says, they glorified God because of me. Wouldn't you? Man, here's the guy that was wasting the church, and now he's preaching to us. Thank God. Amen. <laughs> All right, and then Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He who wins souls is wise. And that's what Paul was. He was a soul winner. Daniel 12.3 says, They that are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. So, And we all have a different gift. We all do it a different way. You know, we all have the ability to share Christ. I mean, what does Revelation 12.11 says? It says we overcame him by the, the devil. We overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. You say, well, I haven't memorized a bunch of Bible. I don't, I don't know a bunch. You don't have to. All you got to do is tell them what God did for you. Because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And Psalm 107 verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And then Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they're going to see your good works and they will glorify the Father which is in heaven. I, uh, you, I think you've heard this story a couple times, but I, I want to share it again. Uh, I had a girlfriend way back in, gosh, this would have been 1979, and she got saved. And she moved out. And she had a best friend that was a really strong Christian. And that girl told her, that guy is a demon. He's going to burn in hell. And, and, and my ex-girlfriend told me that. She said, I'm still going to pray for you, even though she said you were a demon. And I, you know, I was like, whatever, go ahead and pray for me. Well, wouldn't you know, about a year later, I got to preach at that little Nazarene church across from the Olive Garden. Pastor Ben Lamaster was the pastor there. And guess who was sitting on the third row right there on the end? That girl who said he's a demon and he's going to go to hell. I didn't know it at the time. Man, I'm sharing my testimony and this girl is falling apart. I mean, just big alligator tears dropping down her. And I'm thinking, maybe this is somebody I treated badly. 
or did something worse, you know, back in the unsaved days. I didn't know who she was. So afterwards, I felt compelled to go up to her and ask her, do I need to apologize to you? <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, no. She said, I need to apologize to you. And she told me who she was. And I said, well, nothing's impossible with God. And that was the very last time I saw that girl. But boy, you talk about a turnaround. Paul said in verse 24, they glorified God because of what they saw in me. They'll glorify God in what they see in you. They'll glorify the Lord. I, I've been talking with a young man who comes, goes to our church today, and they're messing with him at work. And so he called me and he said, you know, what should I do? You know, his, his, I don't think he, he and his dad is too far away. So he called me and he just said, I need some advice. What do I do? So I gave him a three-step program to go and, and told him what his legal rights were at, at, at his employment. So he went through step number one, step number two, and then he stopped there and he called me and he said, should I do step number three? And I said, were they going to allow you to do step number two? And he said, yeah. And I said, no, number three is like the last resort. Don't do that. And he called me back and he said, you know what? I'm going to go back tomorrow. And he said, I'm going to be the best employee they ever saw because I know they're gunning for me. He said, and I'm going to do everything for the Lord. And that's what I'm talking about. Even when evil people come against you, whether it's your personality or whatever else, God can give you the victory and God can change their heart. To, to be uh, good towards you instead of evil towards you. And that's what they're going to do. And so I want to close tonight with verses 23 through 25 in Acts chapter 9. And it says, After uh, many days were fulfilled, the Jews wanted to kill Paul. You know, that's, it's like, wait a minute. This is a guy who was persecuting the church of Christ. Now you want to snuff him? Yeah, because they hated Jesus. And now they hate him too. So in verse 24, they laid a wait uh, for him, but Saul knew about it. And so they were watching the gates day and night to kill him. See, when he went out and when he came in. So his brethren lowered him out of the outer wall in a basket so he could escape. Wow. So a couple of scriptures. Uh, God kept his feet from being taken, and God will do that with us sometimes. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 14. All your T's are together in the New Testament, about two-thirds of the way through. So we're looking for 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's right before uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Thessalonians. Verse 14. For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which, is, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have from the Jews, who both killed the Lord, Jesus, and they killed their own prophets. And now they persecuted us. And they don't please God. They're contrary to all men. They forbid us to speak. To the Gentiles so that they might be saved. And in that they fill up their sins always. Because the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. That's something we really need to remember. God is watching. And people say, man, but look what they're doing. Can't we do something to stop them? Well, I've always thought this. I'd rather have the mafia after me than God. And God's after them. And God will repay. Remember what he says in, in Romans. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. God will repay. It's all throughout scripture. Even Psalm 91, our, our psalm of blessing and, and uh, inheritance that God's going to save us and keep us from all evil. That psalm says, only with our eyes shall we see the destruction of the wicked. So God, God says it's coming. It's just not coming in our time. It's coming in his time. Because God has a plan. And I've, I've written that in my, uh, in my bulletin, and I kind of want to close with that one, once I uh, 
share Proverbs chapter 3. I want to I close with what I wrote for Sunday because I think it's so appropriate even for tonight. And I want to share on Sunday too about taking on the world's problems. Amen? We don't want to do that. <laughs> okay, that's God's job. So Proverbs chapter 3, verse, starting with verse 19. So Proverbs right after Psalms. Proverbs 3, starting with verse 19. The Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. By his understanding he has established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down dew. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and instruction and discretion. They will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk in the way safely, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you won't be afraid. Isn't it wonderful just to lay down at night and know that Jesus is watching over you? Never experienced that for the first 28 years of my life. Uh, no peace at all, just like the scripture says in, in Psalm 55. There is no peace to the wicked, saith my God. There is no peace. But there is peace in the Lord. So he says, when you lie down, you won't be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Don't be afraid of sudden fear. Why? Because fear is a spirit. Didn't you know that? 2 Timothy 1.7, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. It's a spirit. It's a demon spirit. Fear. And it comes upon you suddenly. Spirits go fast. Flesh goes slow. We've talked about that before. If, I, if, I, if we had air conditioning and I turned it on tonight, it would go something like this. Oh, starting to get a little cold in here. And pretty soon people go out to their car and get a coat. That's flesh. Fle flesh things happen slowly. You get angry and then into rage slowly. But the spirit, you're born again just like that. The spirit of fear comes on you just like that. You get bad news, you go to the doctor, you say, man, I've got this thing over here and I'm just wondering what's going on. And then the doctor says the crazy word to you that everybody hates, you have cancer. And boom, all of a sudden the spirit of fear just attacks you. So that's a spirit. And the scripture says here in Proverbs chapter 3, you will walk in the way safely and your foot will not stumble. And when you lie down, you'll not be afraid. You'll lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Don't be afraid of sudden fear. Don't be afraid of the desolation of the wicked when it comes. Because it's going to come and it is coming now. For the Lord will be your confidence and he will keep your foot from being taken. So I'd like to close with this and we'll read it again on Sunday, but... Have, uh, it's called Taking on the World's Problems. Have you ever met anyone who attempts to fix everyone they come across? Those folks live a life of constant stress and frustration. Sandra, you know this better than I do. I've met pastors that say, I hate church. People drive me crazy. Well, that's because you're carrying all of their issues. You're supposed to take them to God. You're supposed to take them and their issues to the Lord. That, you know, it's, we're kind of like a way shower. Just, oh no, this is the way right here. You just go to him. He'll take care of this. Man, if you take on people's burdens, you're going to go nuts. You need a psychiatrist. You can't do that. It's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to what? Point the way. Point the way. So there are three questions we have to answer when we're dealing with people's problems. Number one, we ask, do I believe that God is faithful? Got to answer that one. Is God faithful? Number two, do I believe the Holy Spirit is faithful to convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Is God faithful to do that? So if folks aren't listening to me, do you think they're listening to the Holy Spirit? Because he's the one that's convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Look, if they're not listening to the Holy Spirit, they're not going to listen to you. And they're not going to listen to me. 
That's why God gives us prayer. You know, sometimes when you talk to someone who doesn't want to change, all you do is push them into further rebellion. That's what happened to me before I got saved. I didn't want to hear it. So I just kept talking to them and further went into further rebellion when they talked to me. So what do we do? Well, here's what Jesus said. Come unto me. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all of our care upon him, for he cares for you. And then Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. And here's a fact. God has this amazing plan. And he's working it out right now. And we're looking from the outside in, and we can't figure out what kind of plan is this. Uh, Here's the plan. God says, I know the plans. He didn't say you know them. He said he knows them. I know the plans that I have for your life, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and an expected end. And then we can trust this, Ecclesiastes 3.11, and we'll close there. God will make everything beautiful in his time. Everything's going to be beautiful in his time. Not my time, not your time, his time. But he has set the world in the hearts of the sons of men, that's us, not to know the work that God is doing from the beginning even to the end. I, I quit asking. I don't ask why anymore. Uh, my favorite thing now is, Lord, now that I'm down here, is there anything else you want me to do? <laughs> and he, he usually says, uh, either be still and know that I'm God, or stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Once in a while he'll say, yeah, I want you to pray for this person or, or go and talk to this one. But you know what? I can't even change me. How am I going to change anybody else? So only God can change us. And so when you run into these things where you're just constantly trying to fix everybody around you, stop it. You can't do it. There's real freedom in just letting go and letting God. There's real freedom in that. You say, but they'll think you don't care. Oh no, I care. And you care. But God cares a whole lot more than we care. And that's the one we need to take them to. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to close in prayer tonight. And we have um, goodies in the back, refreshments. So if you want to join us, you're more than welcome to do that. Lord, I want to thank you for... Wow, Lord, I learned a lot tonight. I'm so thankful, Father, for your grace and your mercy in our lives. I'm sure Paul was one of the most persecuted Christians on earth. And yet, Lord, he had your joy. He said all he wanted to do is get to know you and the power of your resurrection and even the fellowship of your sufferings. So Lord, I know that blessings come through obedience as we study tonight. So Lord, I pray for myself that you would help me to be more obedient. And I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that whatever you've been speaking to them, that their heart would say yes. Because Lord, I know sometimes all we got to do is take the first step and you give us the power to take the rest. So I pray a blessing over uh, my brothers and sisters here tonight and those who would be listening to this later on YouTube. I just ask in Jesus' name, Father, that you do your work in us without our interference. You are Lord of our lives. Help us to not just be hearers, Help us to be doers. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you're going to do in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, let it be so. Amen. God bless you, church.